Hey, today we're kicking off a new series called A Few of My Favorite Things. It's our Christmas series. And listen, I love a ton of things about Christmas. And we're going to be talking about some of that over these next few weeks. But one of my favorite things about Christmas are Christmas movies. A little bit of audience participation. Hey, that shout out, what are some of your favorite Christmas movies? Somebody go. Okay, okay. What, relatively one at a time. Elf. All right. That's Claire's favorite Christmas movie. Somebody else. The Christmas Story. You're going to shoot your eye out, right? Somebody else. White Christmas, Christmas Vacation, the, It's a Wonderful Life, anyone else? Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. Um, let's wrestle with that. Raise your hand. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Okay, now down. Is Die Hard not a Christmas movie? All right. Just because you kill a bunch of Russians at Christmas time doesn't make it a Christmas. Um, hey, so... Uh, Hey, one of my favorite Christmas movies was mentioned, and, uh, and it is Christmas Vacation. Now, I got to say, when you watch that movie, as I did first time when I was 13 years old, you notice a lot less of the uh, things that are inappropriate as you do when you first introduce your 10-year-old to the movie. And I'm like, when Lauren turned 10, I'm like, Lauren, this is the best Christmas movie ever. Let's totally watch this. And, uh, and then I was like, this is so much dirtier than I remember it. And uh, now here's the thing. We see in that movie, we see these epic Christmas lights. Now, how many of you guys are super into Christmas lights? Yes? How many of you guys put Christmas lights on your house? How many of you guys take the easy way out and you just project them on now? Yes? <laughs> Barely even committed to Christmas. And uh, how many of you guys like couldn't look for the area in town to look at the best Christmas lights? How many of you guys are sad that the guy on that Tania Lane in Galena doesn't do it anymore? He retired. And I'm praying that someone, if you never went out there, it was the best Christmas lights in Reno. It was kind of on the same level as Christmas Vacation. I just want to give a challenge to one of you to take up that mantle. <laughs> and so, uh, hey, uh, so, hey, here's my question. I wonder, I wonder if Christmas lights really have a lot more meaning than maybe we've ever thought about. I, I wonder if Christmas lights might point to, to one of the real meanings of Christmas. If you have your Bible, go over to John chapter 1. Woo! So good. John chapter 1. Now, in the other Gospels, the Gospel writers go into some detail about kind of the biographical and historical elements uh, to, um, around the first Christmas. And, and John, as he writes his Gospel, um, doesn't do that. John really kind of looks at, at uh, the incarnation of, of Jesus coming to earth. He, he really looks at it kind of more through a theological lens and, and kind of what does it mean. And so we see here, I'm going to begin in John 1, 1. First couple of verses probably won't be on the screen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything that was made was, was made that was made. In him was life. This is the key verse. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. It goes on to say the light shines in the darkness. Here, here, here's what I want you to get first. We, that we are sustained by the light of Jesus. What we see here in this verse here is that there's this direct connect between life and light. That's what, what it says here in John chapter 1. It says, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. Now, one of the themes in the gospel of John is this thing of Jesus as the light. Go over to John chapter 8. Let me show this to you. John chapter 8. In, in here we see Jesus refers to himself as the light of the world. But let me give you a little bit of background. So in, in the, the, what's happening here is we, we see in John chapter 7, the chapter before, in John chapter 7 and 37, we see that, that Jesus is in Jerusalem celebrating what's called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of, of Booths. Uh, Jews refer to it as Sukkot, which means tabernacle or booth. 
And, and so what, what it was is it was a, a multi-day, all-week, holiday week of, of, of feasts uh, as, as, they were to, as they were remembering God's faithfulness, as, as they were led out of Egypt towards the Promised Land, as they were in the wilderness, that, that they, they, weren't, they didn't have permanent dwellings. They were kind of camping for these years and years and years, and, and that, God was, uh, that God took care of them in this. And so they would have all of these ceremonies remembering God's faithfulness to care for them as they were wandering in the wilderness. And so there was one ceremony that they did where they would pour out um, pitchers of water. They'd pour out this water as they remembered the moment where, where they needed water and God told Moses to touch the, the rock and, and then the water came out. God provided the water. And so in John chapter 7, verse 37, now in this moment, Jesus' ministry, the, the intensity is heating up. He's getting more and more opposition. It's becoming clearer and clearer who he is and, and, and he's just making it crystal clear. And so so in John 7, verse 37, and it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. And he said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living Water. It's the same thing Jesus said to the woman at the well. As, as, as they were going to get some water out of the well, Jesus said, hey, hey, the, wa the water I'm going to give you will never thirst again. He says it's, gonna, it's this water that brings ultimate satisfaction. And, and so, so in that moment, there's that ceremony at the Feast of Tabernacles. But another symbol they had was they had these four giant, they called them candelabras, but I don't want you to think of small little candles. These are giant, um, most historians would see them as very large fires. One historian references that, that, that during this feast, when those candelabras were lit, that, that you could see the light from all over Jerusalem. And, and so kind of imagine the, kind of the Luxor, you know, <laughs> they, that you could see the light from all over Jerusalem. as this epic fires, right? And that was a picture of God's guidance at, 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 and of the Jews as he led them in the day as a cloud and at night by, by fire, the, the fire by night. That, that God, it was a symbol of his presence and his guidance and his protection. And, and so they would light up these candelabras, which were a picture uh, of, of, of God's presence and and God's guidance, right? And so most historians believe here in John chapter 8 that what has happened is now the feast is over. The light has just gone out. Jesus is standing in front of these candelabras, and here's what he says, John 8, 12. He says, I am the light of the world. Let me show it to you. John 8, 12, he says this. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. And here Jesus again shows us that, that light and life go together. He says, but we'll have the light of life. See, one thing about Jesus being the light of the world, it speaks to the fact that Jesus is absolutely necessary for our lives. So many of the things that Jesus compared himself to were things that we absolutely need for survival. Je Jesus said, I I'm the living water, whoever drinks of me. He says, I'm the bread of life. And so I believe it might be sinful to go on a low-carb diet because Jesus, here's the thing, Jesus wouldn't compare himself to something that wasn't awesome, right? Jesus isn't like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm the spam of life. Half, you know, most people don't even like spam, right? He says, I am the bread of life. So eat as much bread as you can is my take home. And so, uh, but what he's saying is he's saying, listen, man, you got to have water to make it. You're going to die if you don't get some water. Man, you got to have some food to make it. And in this cultures like this, they didn't have the benefit of all the, the, the different uh, varieties and types of food. It, it was a pretty basic diet. And if you weren't eating bread, you weren't eating much. And he says, so, and then he says here, he says, I am the light of the world. Again, it's this, this thing that, that without it, we don't survive. Everything goes away with, without light. And, and so what Jesus is saying is he's saying, listen, if you want to really live, then I'm what's necessary in your life. The he says, we are sustained by his light. And in doing so, Jesus, as he identifies himself with, with that pillar of fire at night, what Jesus is doing is he's is fully identify himself with God. And, and so Jesus is just out there, says, yes, are you asking if I'm saying I'm God? I'm telling you that. I'm telling you, I am equating myself with the God who displayed himself as fire and led us through the wilderness. I am am the light of the world in doing so. He says we are sustained by the light. Here's the next thing. We are hopeful because of the light of Jesus. Look back at John chapter 1. 
verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness. Here's one thing I, I uh, love about the Scripture. It is that I love how the Scripture doesn't seek to gloss over the fact that, that we live in a broken world where, where there is some darkness. Now listen, you guys feel quite chipper this morning, and which I appreciate that. I'm going to take us a little bit of a downer for a minute, but then we're going to come out, okay? Can you guys go on that journey with me? I don't, don't want us to get sad forever, just for a few minutes. So when, G, when the Bible talks about darkness, I'm going to dig into a little more detail about what it kind of means. But what, what the scripture is clear about is that we do live in this broken world, right? This fallen, broken world where there's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain and things don't always go right. And I, and I don't know about you, and maybe this is just me, and if so, uh, it's just me. But this year feels a little darker to me than some. It just feels, it's for our country, whether you think about the, and I know these things come in cycles, and, but whether you think about natural disasters, I mean, we saw some epic uh, disasters, whether it's the fires close to us, the hurricane in Texas, the hurricane in Florida, and it hitting other places, it just felt, I know these things come in cycles, but it just felt a little more intense than, than maybe we're used to, or, and then we saw the largest mass murder in our own state, and in the history of our nation, modern history, and, and it's like, man, we just kind of seem to be able to kind of find new lows to go to in terms of, and then just not even about a month after, we saw the largest shooting at a church, small town Texas, where you'd just think, man, nothing, you know, and, and it's, you know, and then just the political tenor of our country, we seem so polarized on both sides, and it's just, just so tense, and it just feels like it's been a little darker year than, does it feel that way to anybody else, or is it? Is it just me? Because if so, just pray for me, right? Um, but it feels like it's been a little bit dark. And I love how the scripture doesn't ever try to make it seem like there's not going to be some of that. You know, that we get this picture from the beginning that, that, that there, we do live in this fallen, broken place. And, and, and whether it's the brokenness that we experience in our own life or up close to us, whether the brokenness that comes from, from sickness or losing a loved one, which can make the first holiday after losing a loved one is always so terrible, or, or whether it's, it's wars or whether it's sickness or famine, all of these things that we just kind of live in this, or just people just doing e terribly evil things, that we just, that there is this darkness. There's no denying it. But I love how the scripture also gives hope in it. And that here, here we see. It says the light shines in the darkness. There's no doubt there's some darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. See, the, the thing is, the, uh, what, what the John's saying here is that because of Jesus, who is the light of the world, that it's not going to always be the way it is. That, that there, that's not going to always be dark, but that there's going to be a time because of what Jesus came to do, because he took the, the punishment for our sins, because he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death and hell, that because of that, that, that there is hope. Even in these moments that you're like, wow, we just seem to get more jacked up and more jacked up, and what is wrong with us? And man, it just makes you want to turn off the news and bury your head in the sand, and it's like, man... But there's this hope that the darkness will not overcome it. And that because of Jesus and what he did, there's going to be a time when he's going to wipe away every tear. And there's not going to be any more sickness. And there's not going to be any more mass shootings. And there's not going to be any more families falling apart. And there's not going to be any more hurricane. Not going to be any of that. Because we have this hope in the darkness because Jesus is the light of the world. Now, when the Bible talks about darkness and light, uh, one th the, Bible, the Bible sometimes speaks about darkness referring to ignorance. Sometimes we refer to maybe someone that doesn't know the, the details or the facts of a matter. We refer to them as being in the dark. So it can refer to ignorance where light refers to truth. We, sometimes uh, the Bible refers to darkness as, as to do with evil, and light has having to do with good, even all this far. Let me show you, Acts chapter 16. Even that it can actually refer to uh, Acts chapter 26. Let me show this to you. 
that it can actually, darkness can speak of Satan and light can speak of God. So Jesus, as he's appearing to Saul on his way to Damascus and before he becomes the apostle Paul, Jesus says this to Paul. Paul's telling this, this story to some people. So Jesus says, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. So when we come to faith in Jesus, what, what's happening is we're going from darkness to light. We're going from ignorance to truth. We're, we're going for, from evil to good. And let me show you here. And from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And, and so because of Jesus being the light of the world, and it says that the darkness does not overcome the light, that we're hopeful. Even when we experience pain in our own lives, even when we experience suffering, even of those up close to us, even as we just see what seems to be going on in our nation and around the world, that, that it, as easy as it would be to get overwhelmed and beaten down, we have this truth that, that Jesus is the light of the world and the light is going to overcome. It's not going to always be like that. And because of that, we've got hope. Go back over to John chapter 1. Let me show this to you. That Jesus is the light of the world, and we, his followers, reflect the light of Jesus. Let me show this to you. John chapter 1, verse 6. Says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this is Jesus' cousin. You might know him as John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So why does it say that there? Here's why. Because people saw John and saw something different in John. And they, they said, are you the one? Are you the Messiah we've been waiting for? Are you the one? And John said, no, I'm not the one. In fact, the one that's coming is so much better. I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. He says, I'm not the one. He said, I'm, but I'm here to prepare the way. So here, here's the thing. They thought John was the light, but he wasn't the light. But he did reflect the light. And, and here's a unique thing about Jesus saying, I'm the light of the world. See, Jesus said lots of things about himself. He said, he said I'm the light of the world. He says, I'm, I am the, the bread of life. He said, I am the vine. He says, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way and the truth and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. He says all these little statements that begin with, with I am. But of all of those statements, there's only one where he says, hey, you're the same thing. See, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, but he never said, you're the bread of life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life, but he never said, you're the resurrection and the life. He said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, but he never said, you are. He said, I'm the gate. He said, I'm the good shepherd, but he never said, you're the gate. You're the good shepherd. Of all the things that Jesus said about himself, there's one that he also said about us. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Throw it, throw it up there. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And the city on a hill cannot be hidden. And see, actually, we get a little more clarity. So, is, so Jesus says in one place, I'm the light of the world. He says in another place, you're the light of the world. What is that? How does that even come together? Well, in John 9, 5, he brings clarity. Jesus said, for as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus says, hey, 33 years, I'm on earth, I'm walking around. I'm the light of the world. He says, but I'm going to die on the cross, raised from that, and be ascended into heaven, and then you, my followers, are going to, as my spirit lives inside of you, you're going to reflect my light, and you're going to become the light of the world. And now we see in the life of John the Baptist, what did it look like for, for him? He says, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light. We reflect his light as we bear witness about the light, as we point people to Jesus, that all might believe through him. We, we become the light as we reflect the light of Jesus and point people to Jesus. And, and the things we, we say and the things we do, that, that, we, that our goal is to point people to Jesus. And when we do this, we also become the light of the world. I want to give you three easy opportunities for you immediately to, to just get tangible about this. How can, I, how can I be the light of the world? Jesus was the light of the world. Now he told me to be. How, what does it look like? A few things. Here's one thing. A, a great way that you can bear witness about Jesus is in getting baptized. Next Sunday, we're, we're having a baptism. And, and uh, 
you say, what's baptism? Well, baptism is people that have made the choice to follow Jesus. Jesus said, go and make disciples, followers, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes in power. People say, what must I do to be saved? Peter says, repent, which is that kind of have a whole change of direction of your life. No longer live for yourself, but begin to follow Jesus. He says, repent and let each one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. Baptism is really that first step, our way of going public with the difference that Jesus has made. But here's the thing about baptism. When you, this is so cool, when you get baptized, you actually are giving this, you're visually preaching the gospel. We we make this picture of the gospel. When you go under the water, it's a picture of Jesus dying and being buried. When you come out of the water, it's a picture of Jesus being raised from the dead. When you go under the water, it's a picture of the old you before you knew Jesus dying. And you come out of the water, a picture of this brand new you alive in Jesus. It's a picture of the fact as you're in that water that, that, that Jesus has washed away your sins. And so in a great easy way, first step really, that, that, that we are the light of the world. is When we get baptized, we invite people that maybe they don't yet know and follow Jesus. And they come and they get baptized and we tell them what it means. And so we're doing that next Sunday. If you're interested, you can sign up at the Hub. Maybe you've got a kid in elementary school that's interested in baptism or been asking questions about Jesus. We've got a class today at 3.30 in the Zephyr Room for parents with their elementary age kids. That's one easy way that you can be the light of the world. Let me give you another one. Another thing, an opportunity we have for us just to be the light of the world in our neighborhood. Let me ask you a question. How many of you guys live in Damani Ranch? Raise your hand. A lot more Damani Ranch people first service, about the, uh, half the people first service. You guys, something different. And so, um, <laughs> but don't, just because you don't live here, I'm, not, I'm still talking to you, right? It's, it, you, you have the opportunity to be a missionary from Curdy Ranch all the way to Damani Ranch. It's amazing. Um, here it is. So our neighborhood beginning last year, started doing this little Christmas thing, right, where they, they have like this little walk of lights where people put lights on the little back fence that goes up to the path, and then they gather at the, the park here in the Monty Ranch, and they have a little Christmas thing. And so last year, a handful of Life Church people just served cocoa and kind of hung out, and, and so that they've asked us to partner with them again and to kind of do even more. So here we're, but it's, we're just going to do a couple of little things. It's super easy. One is we're going to be serving cocoa. We're going to have people next week kind of wearing Life Church shirts, red Life Church shirts. And we're just going to be serving cocoa and just being just good neighbors. Jesus talked about giving a cup of cold water in his name. We're going to be giving a cup of warm cocoa in his name, which is probably an upgrade. And, and, and so here's the second thing. We're, and there's, this is a low talent required opportunity, right? Like I could almost pull this off. This is how low talent this is. That we're, we're going to have a handful of people. We might have six. We might have 36. I don't know. We're going to have a handful of people that are just going to be singing Christmas carols. They wear just some Red Life Church shirts. But here's the cool thing about those Christmas carols. And some of those Christmas carols actually preach the gospel. Talk about how Jesus was born so that we'd never have to die. And, and, and so it's, an, it's really just a cool opportunity. And it's just going to be a fun night. If you're interested in doing that, you can sign up out there. On, there's a table on the left. I'm just take, taking names. If you want to do Coco, you just got to show up in time for the event. We'll follow up with you. I think the event starts at 530. We'll probably get there at 5. Starts at 530 next Saturday the 16th. And if you want to do the caroling, next, and it's not next Saturday the 16th. It's Sunday after next the 16th. And if you want to do the caroling, we're going to have uh, Pastor Tom in his previous life was like a choir director. Mr. Tom's a man of many abilities um, and is a great singer. Um, and so next Sunday during our 815 service in the Zephyr room, just going to have a quick practice for those that want to carol. But here's the thing about caroling. It's really more about your happy face than about your voice. Because if you can't sing, just sing quietly and smile. And so uh, <laughs> and we'll let you know. Um, and, just, uh, and so uh, you go out, sign up, and then you can practice next. And then here's the third way that you can, you can be the light of the world is uh, – is and showing the love of Jesus to the least of these. 
And so there's a, when you guys give to Life Church, we're able to partner with a ton of local ministries and, and national mission organizations. One of our favorite partner ministries is Awaken, which helps um, bring ladies out of sex-related industries, out of the clubs, out of, out of the brothels, out, off the streets. And uh, they help them kind of get a fresh start in a new life. And so we have the opportunity to buy them and, and even their kids, in some cases, um, Christmas gifts. And you can go out to the Christmas tree, and you can grab one of those off there. And in doing so, you are, you are loving the least of these in the name of Jesus. And, and so uh, it's a great opportunity. We need those gifts brought back next Sunday. So you take it today, you bring it back a week from today, so, or you can drop it off by our office this week. Some opportunities, because Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but as you reflect my light and point people to me, you become the light of the world. And here's my last thing. Go over to John chapter 1, verse 9. We are changed by the light of Jesus. Look here. It says the true light. Let me get, if you get nothing else, get this. Jesus is the true light. You live, we live in a moment where there's plenty of people who point to all kinds of lights and say, well, it doesn't matter which light you pick, or they'll come up with this whole other idea of, of a Jesus that is no, nothing like the Jesus of the Scriptures. The Jesus of the Scriptures is the true light. He says, uh, verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him. But look here, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The ultimate game changer is becoming a child of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So here's the thing. Light changes the things it comes in contact with. Light changes everything. And, and, and so here's the thing. Jesus doesn't just want to be the light of the world. Jesus wants to be the light of your world. And, and as, as the light of your world changes everything. See, the thing is, light gives direction. Light, light helps us know where we're going. And that was that original symbolism of the, the children of Israel, the cloud by day, the fire by night, a symbol of God's presence, but also a symbol of God's direction. It's a, when, it's, when the lights are out, it's hard to even know where we're going. Years and years ago, we, we, uh, we bought a car in Sacramento. We bought it late at night. We were driving over the pass, and I'm um, driving over Donner Pass, and I felt like the headlights weren't sufficiently bright. So I'm fiddling with the headlights, saying, well, maybe they're not fully on. And I'm fiddling with them. And, and, uh, and so then I managed to turn them off. And somehow then I, because it's, now it's dark, now I, can no longer, I can't even see to turn them back on. And it was probably like two and a half seconds of complete darkness at 80 miles an hour. But it felt like forever. Because I couldn't see where I was going. And I felt like it had no direction. And, and, and maybe for you. Maybe you're in a moment where you just feel like, man, my, my life's going nowhere. And I don't even know what matters. And I don't really feel like I'm living according to any kind of purpose. But I, I want you to know that as Jesus becomes the light of your world, he, he begins to give purpose and he begins to give direction. It doesn't have to be like that. See, the thing is, light also removes fear. We, we learned as kids, so no one has to teach us to be scared of the dark, but little kid, they're just scared of the dark. And, and even as grown-ups, you, you know, you walk into a strange place, you walk into a house you've never been in before. You, the other day, I was walking into a hotel room, and I couldn't find the light. I'm just kind of looking all around, and then in the back of your mind, I mean, I'm not typically scared of the dark, but I thought, is someone in here to murder me now? And uh, <laughs> there's this fear that comes in the darkness. And, and so then I began to think about how am I going to defend myself? And... Uh, and I was ready. And so, uh, <laughs> but light, light removes fear. And, and maybe as you go through life, maybe you're just scared. Scared of, the f scared of the future. Scared of being alone. Scared to die. And, and the thing is that, that when Jesus becomes the light of your world, he takes away fear because he overcame our biggest fears. When, he, when Jesus rose from the dead, he overcame the fear of death. He overcame the fear of, of hell. He overcame the fear of being alone because he said he'll be with us forever and ever. And, and so 
light takes away fear. Light cleans and purifies. You know, we all know the, the, cleanse, the, the purifying power of, of UV light. Maybe you've been to the dentist and, and they've whitened your teeth. They put on some chemical and then they shine the super bright light. And then, wow, you've got a movie star fresh smile. The rest of you looks like the old you. Um, but your smile is awesome. And so, I uh, thought that was good. Um, and so, uh, but light cleanses and purifies. And when Jesus becomes the light of your world, maybe, maybe right now you feel kind of dirty on the inside. Maybe you go through life, just maybe there's something you did a week ago, a year ago, or 30 years from now where, where you just can't let, let it go and you've got this guilt and shame and regret. But, but the good news is when Jesus becomes the light of your world, he, he purifies, purifies and cleanses and, and, and takes away all of our guilt shame and, and, and all of our sin. He makes us clean. He makes us brand new. So I, here's the thing. Jesus is the light of the world, no matter what you say about it. But he wants to be the light of your world. And that's a choice. I want to give you a chance to do that. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes. You say, well, what do I need to do? Man, if I want to give my life to Jesus you say, man, I've never even heard this. Or maybe you say, man, I've heard this a million times. Maybe you say, man, I hadn't been in church in forever. Or maybe you say, I've been in church for decades and done a bunch of religious stuff, but I don't know that I've ever really given my life to Jesus. What do I need to do? First thing is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe he died on the cross for your sins. Believe that he took the punishment that I deserve, punishment that you deserve. Believe that he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death and hell. Believe that he's your only hope. And then, so we believe, and then, and then we also, we, the Bible says we repent, and really what that means, it just means to turn around and to say, God, I don't want to keep living life on my terms, going my direction, doing my own thing, but I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. So I want to give you that chance. If that's what you want to do, you can just pray something like this with me. Just, Father, thank you for loving me, and thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. And God, I believe he rose from the dead. And I believe that he took the punishment I deserve. And I believe that, that, that he is your son. And God, I don't want to keep living life on my terms, doing my own thing. But God, I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. So God, would you come and live inside of me now in the person of your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name. I pray, amen.